Welcome, friends, to Voice of Assurance, the MP3 edition. I'm Dr. Tom Kakuza, pastor of Northland Bible Baptist Church in St. Cloud, Minnesota. The purpose of Voice of Assurance is to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ and to equip believers through verse-by-verse -verse preaching and topical message. Now, while there is no substitute for individual participation in a sound local church, I trust these messages will augment your spiritual growth and be a blessing to you. Let's go ahead now to the message. Well, if you have your Bible, would you open it up with me over to John chapter 17, as we are going verse by verse through the Gospel of John. John 17. You know, we're talking about prayer today, and prayer is a vital part of the Christian life. Now, here in John chapter 17, what we have is not... Now, it isn't the Lord telling us what to pray for. What we have in John 17 is the prayer actually of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is truly the real Lord's Prayer. Now, we started on this last week, and um, unless Jesus comes back, we'll probably finish this today. But you see, the Lord answers prayer, and the Lord especially answers the prayer of His Son, of His Son, because they, of course, are one in God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Now, here in John chapter 17, Jesus is praying to the Father. And this is truly the Lord's Prayer. We think usually in terms of the Lord's Prayer being our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. No, that's what Jesus said to his disciples. He said, here's a, here's a pattern for you. This is, this, these are the kind of things you want to include in your prayer. And that's what he gave when he gave that. But this is truly Jesus himself praying. Jesus the Lord praying to the Father. And it's very revealing what he prays about. We saw last time, the first thing uh, he prayed about was he, he has, number one, he has prayed for himself, asking the Father to glorify the Son, verses 1 through 5. Isn't that interesting? The Son would pray for himself, and he prays of the Father to glorify him with the glory that he had before creation. Now, isn't that amazing? And what a claim to deity. Here is Jesus praying to the Father, and he says, Father, glorify me with the glory that I had before creation. Well, listen, if you were before creation, you're not a created being. If you were before creation, you are God. And of course, Jesus is God. And of course, he came to earth and he became a man, never ceasing to be God. But he's saying to the Father here, glorify me with the glory I had before creation the worlds were created. So the Son, the eternal Son, was there. What a statement of deity this is. But secondly, which is what we looked at last week, he prays to the Father for his disciples. Who are his disciples? Those 11 that are left. And he's asking the Lord and he's, he's asking the Father, he's interceding for them because folks, the days ahead for the disciples were going to be difficult days. Not only what they were going to go through when they saw Jesus crucified, but even after he came back from the dead and went back to heaven. Of course, that's when their ministry really kicked in the gear. And he prays for them here in verses 6 through 19. Let's pick this up in verse 14, if you'll look with me. John 17, 14. Jesus says this, I have given them thy word. And by the way, what applies to them, generally speaking, applies to us. So think in those terms. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldst take them out of the world, but that thou shouldst keep them from the evil, or the evil one, referring to Satan. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Now the Lord here does not ask the Father to take them out of the world, but to guard them from the evil one, to guard them from the evil one. Now would the Father do that? Yes, he would. But you might say, well, if the Father would do that, then why is it, why is it that the believers' lives get ruined? Why is it that they succumb to defeat? Why does this happen? Well, it isn't, it isn't that Jesus, that his prayer will not be honored, folks, but as with many prayers, it isn't just, just okay, God's going to override everything and everything's going to be fine. No, many times our participation in the will of God is a key factor in that coming about. 
pastor years ago, he gave me this illustration. He says, when you pray, many times it's like having a flashlight in your hand. And you take that flashlight and you shine that at the need that is there. And then what does the Lord usually want us to do? He wants us to take that flashlight, once we see what the need is and we understand it, to turn it back and to shine it on us. You're the answer to that prayer. Now, with that in mind, look at this. See, the Lord says, the Lord prays to the Father, Father, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but that you would keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am uh, not of the world. The Lord does not ask the Father to take them out, but to guard them from Satan. How is it done? Well, there can certainly be direct intervention in that. I, there's no doubt about it. There can be direct intervention by the Father, but usually it is through our obedience to the Word of God that we are kept from the evil one. That's why it says in Ephesians 6 to put on the whole armor of God. We would not have to put on the whole armor of God if it was just a matter of Jesus having prayed this for his disciples, because they would say, well, it's going to happen. I don't have to worry about Satan because Jesus prayed and, and the Father's going to answer. Well, yes, he, he will, but there's many times a way that the prayer gets answered. And usually it is through our obedience to the Word of God. Folks, do we understand that in the Bible, you know, there's a lot of weird teaching going on about Scripture today. Do we understand that in the Bible there are do's and don'ts? There are things not only that God wants his children to do, but also things that God doesn't want his children to do. There are things that God wants us to be involved in, and many things God says, I don't want you to be involved in that. I want you to stay away from that. That's a dangerous thing. Don't let that infect your thinking. Keep your mind right. Be careful. That's why we've got the scriptures. By the way, that's one reason why the Bible is as thick as it is because it's our instruction manual on life. I think of Ephesians 4, we won't go there because of time, but Ephesians 4 talks about putting off certain things, putting on certain things. It's not automatic. It doesn't just happen. No, God says, this is what I want you to do. And folks, it's through the application of scripture that we are kept from the evil one. It says we obey the Word of God. And by the way, it isn't just the parts we like. It's also the parts that change us, that are challenging, but those things many times that are the most challenging, if we will by faith step out and say, Lord, you know what? That's going to stretch me, but I'm going to trust you and I'm going to do it anyway. And God provides grace. And then that's how he transforms us. And folks, as he transforms us, we become more like Christ and we don't fall prey to the strategies or the wiles of the devil. So powerful. Look at verse 17. Jesus said, he, he's, remember now, he's praying, how is this going to take place? Verse 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The word sanctify means to be set apart. It means to make pure, to make holy. We see this in scripture. Vine's Expository Dictionary states, thus, sainthood or sanctification is not an attainment. It is the state into which God and grace call sinful men and in which they begin their course as Christians. Yes, as we covered in Sunday school today, when you trust Christ as Savior, you are sanctified. But then there's the second tense or aspect of sanctification, that as we walk with the Lord and we apply his word to our lives, we are being set apart. We are being made more pure in our walk, in our daily lives as Christians. And this is what he does, and this is how the Lord works. It is through the word of God. What keeps the believer pure and clean while we are out trying to win people to Christ in this lost, perverse world? It's the word of God. It's the word of God. It is the source that brings balance to the life of the believer. The Bible transforms us, and this all has to do with that word sanctify or sanctification. The Bible transforms our lives. Folks, we need that. Hold your place here and look at Psalm 119. Psalm 119. I know I've mentioned this before, but don't you think it's quite interesting that by far the longest chapter in the Bible is the one that has to do with the word of God itself. God is saying something in that, folks. God is saying something significant. 
He devotes the biggest portion of any chapter in the, in the Bible, the, the biggest chapter of all the chapters, he devotes that to his written word. So in the written word, the biggest chapter is the one about the written word. There's significance in that. We can't blow that off. So this is why we emphasize not only knowing the scriptures, but applying the scriptures. Psalm 119, look at verse 9 with me. It says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto, according to thy word. What does the Bible do? The Bible will clean up the life of the Christian. It will clean up the life of the Christian. But it's not just by reading it. It's by reading it and then applying it to life. Verse 10, with my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Isn't that easy to do, to wander? You know, folks, that's why it's so incredibly valuable that we have the word of God in print. Because as we wander, we can go back and we can say, oh, you know what? I need that refreshment. I need God to refresh my thinking again. I need him to straighten me out. I think all of us in this room, if you're a Christian, all of us have experienced that. We wander spiritually. We wander mentally sometimes. And we get back to the scriptures and it's like a cleansing. There's a cleansing that takes place of our thinking and of our spirit. And the Lord gets us back on track and renews our spirit within us to where we're refreshed and we're alive and we're locked in again. We're on focus again as Christians. This is the word of God. This is how the Lord sanctifies us in a practical sense, sets us apart, makes us more holy, makes us more pure. It's the word of God. Verse 10, with my whole heart have I sought thee, O let me not wander from thy commandments. Verse 11, thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. You know what, dear friend, if you're a Christian and you're not hiding God's word in your heart, you're sinning more than you need to sin. I tell you that. You're sinning more than you ought to sin because the word of God is what the Lord uses to convict us, to warn us, to guide us, to encourage us. See, it is foolish to pray for purity while at the same time indulging in sin. It's foolish. It's hypocritical. What is a hypocrite? A hypocrite is someone who says there's too much sex and violence on their DVD player. That's a hypocrite. Oh, there's so much trash in the media. Well, then don't watch it. Oh, it's so perverse. It's so corrupt. Well, then don't watch it. Oh, it's bringing me down. Turn it off. (laughs) I just can't. No, you just won't, friend. You want a dirty life? You want a defeated Christian life? You want the constant conviction and guilt? Well, if that's what you want, keep it on. But God says what? In the Psalms, here's another warning. In the Psalms, it says this. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Boy, isn't that clear? Isn't that simple? And you know what? If we follow that, then our thoughts will not be as perverse, as corrupt, as self-defeating. But we have to follow it. Let's go back to John chapter 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Verse 18. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. Now, how was Jesus sent into the world? Luke chapter 19, verse 10. It says, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. The Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. See, notice, we are to seek the lost. We cannot save them, literally, we can't save their souls, but we can seek them, and what we can do is we can lead them to the Savior by presenting the gospel clearly to them. The Lord Jesus Christ has passed the torch to us once he went back home to heaven. He came into the world to seek and to save that which was lost. He ascended to heaven, and what did he tell his disciples? Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Okay? He accomplished the gospel. He did the gospel. He died for our sins, was buried and came back from the dead three days later. And he says, this message will bring salvation if people will just understand what I've done for them. Now you take the message and now you go and share it with others. As the Father has sent me, even so send I you. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. Can I ask you a question this morning? Are you seeking 
the salvation of those who are lost? Or are you just a Christian sponge? Come to church, hear it, learn. Oh, we love to learn. We love to learn. But folks, if we are not learning with the mind of application, we're not learning as God would have us to learn. You know, it doesn't take a long time to get on the road to being an effective Christian. It really doesn't. Maybe a couple months, that's it. From the point of salvation, a couple months, learn the right things, you're off. Does that mean you're never going to stumble or you're not going to have misunderstandings? Or that? No, 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 none of that. But you know what? Just a couple months, you can learn the basic foundational things of the Christian life and at least start setting out to live for Christ after a couple months. Look with me over to Romans chapter 1. We have been entrusted with the good news of Christ. Here's how the Apostle Paul saw it. In Romans 1, look with me to verse 14. It says, I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Verse 17, for therein, in the gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed. From faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Can I explain this to you today? Maybe you're here and you've never seen this before, never understood this before. I have a responsibility as a pastor, but first as a Christian, to share with you what Christ has done for the entire world. I have that responsibility, and I take it seriously, and I hope you do too. We are all sinners, including me. I point a finger at you. I've got three pointing back at me. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Here we are as sinners. Now, the Bible teaches us God loves the world. That means he loves me, and he loves you. God loves us. He hates our sin, but he does love us. To get to heaven, we have to be cleansed of our sin. It has to be gone right? Well, we've got it. We've got sin. God says sin must be paid for. And if we die, if we die not having our sin taken away, if we die, we're going to have to spend eternity in hell paying for it ourselves, right? The wages of sin is death, the Bible says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. There's nothing we can do, the Bible says, to get rid of the sin. Heaven's a perfect place. For us to get there, we have to be Sinless. We have to be perfect in the eyes of God. None of us are. So then we're all disqualified. We cannot make it. Now that's bad news. But this is the predicament that the world is in. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Because there's nothing we could do to work the sin off. Good deeds will not do it. God sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when Jesus died on Calvary, he made the payment for our sin so that we would not have to. He took all of our sin upon himself and he made that payment by shedding his blood. And he rose from the grave three days later. And he says this in his word, that if you will believe that he did that for you, if you will believe he paid for all your sin, trust in him that he did that for you, he will give you that very moment, everlasting life as a gift, as a gift. But you have to believe. You notice he said, to everyone that believeth. Now, believing doesn't just simply mean he exists. It means you trust in him that he made that payment for you. Let's look over in chapter 10 of Romans. Look at Romans chapter 10. Most people today are trying to establish their own righteousness through good works. They think, well, I'm going to be sincere. I'm going to give money. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to get baptized. All of those things, folks, are good to do, but none of those things will take away sin. It is only through the payment Christ made that we receive everlasting life. In Romans chapter 10, Paul is talking about his kinsmen according to the flesh, which are Jews, but it applies to all of us. In Romans chapter 10, Let's look at verses 1 through 4. It says this, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel, and I will just say for all mankind, is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, 
but not according knowledge. In other words, they're zealous. They may be zealous for spirituality, for religion, but they don't understand the truth, not according to true knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Verse 4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Watch this. To everyone that does what? believes. Believes. You believe. You put your faith in Jesus Christ that his payment on the cross was sufficient to pay for all your sins, and you trust him as your Savior, and he gives you as a gift, friend, eternal life. No strings attached. It's yours the moment you trust Christ. You notice in verse 4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. See the commandments. What do the commandments teach us? The commandments are not a way to get to heaven. A lot of people don't understand that. The commandments will not save you. What the commandments do is show us that we're sinners because we can't keep them perfectly. I'm not saying they're bad. They're righteous. In Galatians, it says, listen, if, if righteousness could have been through the law, verily it would have been through the commandments because the commandments are straight from God. The commandments are pure. The commandments are holy. But we could never keep them. People who say to get to heaven, I have to keep the commandments are people who are, who are saying, you know what? I condemn myself to hell because they don't keep the commandments. They don't. No. The Bible says Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. Once you trust Christ as Savior, you are secure in Christ. Now, as we move on this morning, let me, let me just say this before we move on. If you've never understood that your good works will not save you until today, if you've never trusted Jesus Christ alone as your Savior, would you please, dear friend, trust him as your Savior today? You cannot go to heaven except by Jesus Christ and only Jesus Christ. Trust him as your Savior, and he will give you salvation as a gift. He'll give you everlasting life. And what does that mean? It means it's life that lasts forever. Now let's go back to John chapter 17. Jesus continues in his prayer, and here in John chapter 17, he has prayed for himself, asking the Father to glorify the Son. We see that he has prayed for his disciples, He's gone to the Father on behalf of his disciples, verses 6 through, well, we'll look at verse 19. He says in John 17, 19, And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. What sanctifies us? The truth. What is the truth? It's the word of God. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. But we see, thirdly, he prays for the future believers who will make up the church. Now, let me say that again, and let's let that sink in. This is, this is really, if I could use the term, neat, all right? He prays for the future believers who will make up the church. Think of it. Think of it. The Lord was praying for you and me, folks, 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, he was praying for us. Verse 20, neither pray I for these alone, who? His disciples, who he was with at this point. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also, which shall believe on me through their word. Who is that? Us. I have believed on Christ through their word. Their word is the word of God that has been witnessed about through generation to generation to generation. On Sunday nights, we're studying the book of Acts. And those of you who, who have been with us, you know that we've already covered where the word of God, where the gospel went from Asia and then it crossed over into Europe. And we are the beneficiaries of when that gospel got into Europe and went all over Europe. And then where did it go from Europe? It came over to the United States. We are benefiting from that even today. But here Jesus is praying for us. Pray for them which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Now look at verse 23, or verse 21, that they all may be one, 
as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Many people see verse 21 as a verse to use to break down theological barriers and to say that those who stand on doctrine, such as us, are not right with God because we are fighting against the unity of the body. Now, this is the common way verse 21 is used. I believe with all my heart that is taking verse 21 out of context. I don't think that is the context of verse 21 at all. What is Jesus praying for? Jesus is praying for the spiritual unity of the church that would be fulfilled with the birth of the church in Acts chapter 2, beginning in Acts chapter 2. Notice the word in, in verse 21. It doesn't say with. It doesn't say with. It says in. In other words, it's the idea of in Christ. In Christ. Not with Christ, but in Christ. There would be a spiritual unity for those who would believe in the future, verse 20, with those who had believed. Do you see that? Verse 20 and 21. There would be a spiritual unity with those who would believe in the future. This is what Jesus is praying for. With those who had already believed. What is that talking about? That's talking about the unity of the body of Christ. The church had not been birthed yet. That began in Acts chapter 2. This unity would bring together both Jew and Gentile, bond and free, male and female, into one body. I believe in verse 21 where it says that they all may be one is referring to one body. Jesus is praying for the future that those who had believed at the time he's talking about it and those who were going to believe that the Father would bring together that one body. Has this prayer been fulfilled? It's being fulfilled. It has been and is being fulfilled. Because every time someone puts their faith in Jesus Christ, whether Jew or Gentile, whether bond or free, whether male or female, they become one in See that key word there in verse 21 is in. With, they become one in Christ, in the body. Let me show you some scriptures on this. Hold your place and look at Galatians 3. Galatians chapter 3. He's praying for the unity of the body. I don't believe, now listen, he does, and I'll, I'll, I'll revisit this statement. He does want us to get along with one another. He does. There's no doubt about that. But folks, that's not what his prayer was contrary to what I think most people see verse 21 to be talking about. I've heard people on TV and on radio, say, oh, you know, these people who are always talking about doctrine, and the Bible says this, and they'll say this, doctrine divides, but love unites. Wait a minute, friend. Biblical love is not the opposite of doctrine. God's the one who gave us the doctrine. Listen, you can have union, but no unity. Unity is based on the Word of God. See, the Word of God is the standard. That's why we call it the canon of Scripture. The canon means the rule or the ruler, literally like a yardstick, the ruler. That's what we measure things by. That's why how we know what is what and what isn't what. If we are all tuned to the same ruler, then we'll have unity. But if people say, well, you know what? I don't want to hear doctrine. I just think we just ought to love one another or be emotional with one another. Now, we ought to love one another, and we ought to be forgiving and kind and all those things. And by the way, how do we know that? Because the Bible says so. It goes back to that standard sanct of sanctification, the Word of God. Galatians 3.26, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ, talking about spiritual baptism, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. The unity Jesus is talking about in John chapter 17 that he's praying for is the unity of the body, meaning of all Jew and Gentile. That was a very, listen, they didn't know what he was praying. He knew what he was praying. Jew and Gentile being in one body, folks, at that point, that was a mystery, not revealed. But Jesus knew what was going on. 
When a person trusts Christ the Savior, they are united with the body of Christ. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It says in verse 12, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12, for as the body is one, see there's a unity there, as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit were we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. I believe with all my heart that the unity Jesus is speaking of in John 17, 21 is the unity of the church being one body made up of Jew and Gentile. All these people, Lord, that they may, Father, that they may be one. That they may be one. Folks, listen. Unity is not based on, I like you, do you like me? Okay? Unity is based on, biblical unity that Jesus is, is talking about here, is based on, we are agreed with what God has said. Now we can have unity in that. There is unity in that. Now again, certainly the Lord wants us, go back, by the way, to John 17. Certainly the Lord wants us as true believers to get along with one another, but that isn't the primary point in uh, John 17, verse 21. He does want us to get along, no. He does want us to have harmony. But again, harmony is based on everybody being tuned to the same thing. That's where unity is found. Guess what? This is where God is calling you and me as Christians today. Yes, we are to be in tune with each other, but what is the standard of that? It's the Word of God. It's the Word of God. You know, this is funny, but the truth is you cannot have practical unity in the body unless we are agreed on the essentials of the faith. And what does that begin with? It begins with the gospel. Now, folks, listen, if we can't agree on the gospel, then how in the world are we going to have true unity in the body of Christ? Paul said in Galatians 1, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert, twist and distort the gospel of Christ. He says, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Does that sound like a mean-spirited fundamentalist? Okay, he's got a bad attitude. No, that's the inspired word of God. There's one gospel, and any other gospel is a false message. So we need to know what the gospel is, and I presented that today, what the gospel is. That's the foundation for fellowship. From there, it goes to anything that the Bible says clearly. Okay, let's get back to our text. John 17, 23, Jesus says, I in them and thou in me. I in them and thou in me. What is that a picture of? That's a picture of what takes place when we trust Christ the Savior. That's why this, is, this unity being spoken of here by Jesus, that we may be one, it's that it would be one, everybody would be in one body. That's what he's getting at. I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and has loved them as thou hast loved me. Let me ask you a question. Does, does Jesus and the Father have to struggle to get along? No. Why? They are one in person. They are one. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Verse 24, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Now where would he be? Well, he would be in heaven. Verse 25, O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. Listen, Jesus in his prayer, he prays for three things. One, he prays for himself, asking the Father to glorify him. Secondly, he prayed for his disciples who were with him at the time. And third, he prays for the future believers who will make up the church, and that's us. That's us. And folks, that prayer has been answered, and that prayer is being answered every time a person puts their faith in Jesus Christ. Doesn't matter your nationality, doesn't matter your religion, none of those things will save you or help. What matters is that you put your faith in Jesus Christ 
as your Savior. Then you can be one with God and one with the body of Christ. Well, friends, that concludes this edition of Voice of Assurance. Thanks so much for listening, and would you share this ministry with a friend? To contact us or learn more about our ministry, please visit www.northlandchurch.com. Your prayers and support for this ministry are greatly appreciated. Thank you so much, and God bless you.